Hospital Port has pride and dignity. Stop the New World Order. Welcome to Hapanwo TV. And uh, this is a video that I'm actually doing with OBS. I've, <coughs> I've just updated it, so hopefully it works a bit better now and you're not getting that awful echoing you got before. But anyway, um, I am actually making another video because, um, as I said in my last video, I actually am not working very much this week. I've got basically every afternoon off, so um, I thought I'd put that time to good use by uh, making videos. So I decided to make another one. I might make another one. I might make a, a third video before the end of the week. I'll see how it goes. I've got an idea for one. But anyway, this is a video about a book, just like the last one. The last one was about Douglas Murray's book. This one is about this book. This is called... Um, I'll just do that, because I might use that as a still for the... Uh, I might use that as a still, like a, a, a thumbnail for the video. A very British girl. Just hit screen, I'll just hit screen cap just briefly. There we go. So that... Uh, no, it's perfect. But the book is called A Very British Coup. The novel that foretold the rise of Corbyn. So I'm just trying to keep, keep it in frame. By Chris Mullin. Now, um, the novel that foretold the rise of Corbyn. It says it's fascinating as it was entertaining when it was first published. That's by Val McDermott. Now, um, this is a 2017 edition. But the book actually dates back to 1982. It was actually written in 1982 by Chris Mullin. Now, Chris Mullin is actually an MP, or he was, yeah, he was, um, he was actually a, he, le oh yeah, he uh, supported the Birmingham Six, that is the people who were wrongly imprisoned for, for IRA bombing, he was an MP, yes, for Sunderland South, yes indeed, um, that's right, he, so it, it's a, a political thriller by an MP, which I think gives it a certain validity, but now, obviously, in 1982, it didn't, it didn't have that subtitle and novel that foretold the rise of Corbyn because in 1982 Jeremy Corbyn was a prospective parliamentary candidate for Islington. He was a young Labour activist and he was shagging Diane Abbott. Um, the first two I can perhaps explain, the last one I honestly can't. But so that was what that was basically what was going on. I'll just one moment, I'm just going to do something quickly with my phone. So it was obviously the, the subtitle was, is, was added in the 2017 edition. But it's very, very interesting. It's a very interesting book. Um, the This new cover is quite good. It's made out to look like a newspaper because it is about the media and it's about politics and how politics is portrayed in the media. But um, it's what's interesting about it is that it's, it has relevance to the situation we're in today. This is why I brought it up when I was on Caroline Stevens' show um, a few weeks ago. I mentioned I was I was talking about a very British coup. Now, the book is very left-wing <coughs> in its stance, um, and it's like, it, I suppose, for, in terms of propaganda value, if, if you can call it a propaganda story, and it is, it is. I wouldn't call it propaganda. It's too well, it's too well written for that. But it is, it has that element to it. I always define propaganda as something that's rather unintelligent and lowbrow. Which is why I brought that subject up about the media in my talk at Probe, about how some of them are on our side. It's not all propaganda. But um, it is. It, it has a very, very left-wing bent, a very, very left-wing perspective. Um, but it could apply just as much to the right wing as well, I think. The story follows a general election in the UK when uh, the leader... The, the election is won by a guy called Harry Perkins. Now, he's the leader of the Labour Party. He becomes Prime Minister. And now, um, it's interesting that the he, he beats all the odds. He's actually a member of Parliament for Sheffield, and he's he's a working-class guy from a family of steel workers, and you, you won't get many Labour MPs like that nowadays, will you? All of them are SJWs and teachers and things like that. But um, it's very interesting that, that like the, the author, he says that he loosely based the character of Harry Perkins on Tony Benn, who looked likely to become the the uh, leader of the Labour Party at the time? There was a, at the time the book was written, 1981, 1982. Uh, Tony Benn, who who died a little while ago, was competing with Michael Foot and several other people to become leader of the Labour Party. There was a big turmoil within the Labour Party, and the uh, it all the, at the end it was Neil Kinnock who actually ended up as the leader and was the next person to run as Prime Minister. But um, What's interesting is that the the manifesto of Harry Perkins within the book is very interesting because the 
what he does is he talks about dissolving new p newspaper monopolies withdraw that is like people at news international rupert murdoch withdraw from nato removing all me mil american military bases on uk soil um that includes wood woodbridge and bentwater so uh Colonel Holt, Larry Warren, they do all have to go home. Uh, unilateral nuclear disarmament and a true open government. Well, the true open government thing is a piece of... They always, they always say they want to be a true open government. But the other things are very interesting because they, they were actually the policies of the opposition at the time the book was written. So that it was not, fe it was not unfeasible that the scenario we see in the book could actually come to pass. Um, he was, it, was a, it was a piece of... Uh, fiction but it was very speculative fiction it's rather like my Roswell trilogy in that sense now um, <coughs> Harry Perkins it was all made into a it was made into like a TV miniseries on Channel 4 and um, funny enough I saw that before I read the book I actually re-watched it a couple of years ago mm. um, there was another one called Secret State that was very good as well I enjoyed that, but the, um, the it was Ray McNally is the actor who plays plays Harry Perkins in the series, and I was kind of like, and that um, it was kind of like I mean I suppose when you watch the video first, or you you watch the program first before the book, it often it often I suppose you often get this image of that that's the image that goes into the book with you and that is the case in most situations however when I was reading a very British coup the book which I like I said I read not long after I saw the TV series I found it was very I found that Harry Perkins in my mind's eye appeared very differently he was more like the guy who used to do the beer adverts you know uh, the sort of like uh, I don't know he was not a black guy but he was sort of a very dark skinned guy with big thick glasses who used to do these adverts for beer and he said if there's one thing a Yorkshireman likes more than this I can't remember the brand of beer it was it's his game of cricket and things like that uh, it was a famous series of TV adverts he looked like that in my mind's eye but he is clearly kind of quite an honest guy he's an honest person he's um, been like a trade unionist all his life he's kind of like the kind of um, left wing person I can sort of respect in the sense that he is he's not into he's not into identity politics or anything like that he is purely about social justice since literal rather than it's orwellian sense so he comes to power in this election and um he has a number of people his various uh people who come with him who are all they're all members of they're all sort of like people who are loyal to him with this one there's one other guy there's one guy who he doesn't trust, and it's, um, I think it's, I can't remember the name of the character, the thing is, the characters, there's a large number of characters in this book, and they all they all blend into one in a, in a way, and then they're not terribly, um, they're not awfully, what's the word, they're not awfully distinctive, and there's a whole, there's a whole sort of like, conference room full of bad guys, which includes uh, Sir, Berg, Sir, Berg, Sir Peregrine Craddock, head of the MI5, Sir George Fison, who owns a consortium of newspapers. Now, it's um, interesting that Sir, Sir George Fison and Sir Peregrine Craddock, again, I got those two mixed up while I was reading the book, but Fison is very obviously based on Rupert Murdoch. There's also, like, um, a member of the cabinet who's kind of very dodgy, who's on the side of um, the conspirators, the people who are against Perkins. And there will be spoilers in this, unfortunately. And the, the, all the others are sort of like on his side. They're all sort of, they're rather like that. And also, the Americans are involved. There's this guy called Marcus Morgan, who is the uh, U.S. Secretary of State. He's always involved as well because he's very much against Perkins because of the they see him as he's a goddamn commie. Remember, this was the Cold War, and he's going to obviously remove Britain from NATO. And of course, N Britain is where America has most of its bases. <laughs> So, of course, this was during the Green and Common protest. This book was written when you had those big camps and they were linking arms all the way around the perimeter of the Green and Common base because there were nuclear st weapons stored there. Uh, excuse me. Um, yet, Sir Lawrence Wainwright is the bad guy in this. I'm just looking through these list of characters here. 
the Chancellor of the Exchequer, later Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, he's a conspirator. He's on Perkins's cabinet, but he's part of the conspiracy to bring him down. And um, the way they bring him down, the, what they do is this con this group of bad guys who, like I said, it's like they, it's like you can imagine any dark-suited men sitting around a conference table. It's, it does remind me a little bit of Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Um, they're all sort of like as evil of those people. They're all as um, Machiavellian as the as the characters in Atlas Shrugged, uh, Wesley Mouch and Bertram Scudder. They all have wonderful names in that book. <laughs> but um, they're not as charismatic, they're not as distinct. I mean, no one does bad guys like Ayn Rand, I promise you, nobody. <laughs> and so there's Marcus Morgan, the US Secretary of State. Funny enough, I went to a school, I went to school with a chap called Marcus Morgan. I haven't seen him for years, but I went to school with him. They're looking for ways to bring him down. They do it in various different ways. For example, Lawrence Wainwright, because he's Chancellor of the Exchequer, he works with people in the civil service who are work, basically working for MI5 to engineer uh, a crash on the pound, or try and engineer, engineer a recession, and then make it, because of course the government take the rap for that, don't they? Um, and there's other things they try to engineer as well. They have a chap called, F what's his name? Oh, he's a guy... He's a, he's a trade union leader who works for the uh, people, he works for the, he's like head of the TUC and he's head of some big, he's a big union official and these were horrible people. I used to know some trade union officials, some senior ones and they were bloody awful. A lot of the grassroots shop stewards weren't bad but once they get above convener level, they're a bunch of twats, they really are. Um, and this guy is like head of the TUC, he's running um, an engineering union and with the help of MI5, because he's actually working for MI5 now, and I'm sure a lot of them do. And so with the help of MI5, he engineers a, a strike. He, he engineers a... Um, he engineers a... Um, he engineers a strike in the power stations, which results in... Um, a cutting a redu reduction. They start by working to rule, and they end up on their complete walkouts. It starts out with limited electricity supply. Now, this actually did happen about ten years earlier, because during the winter of discontent, which is basically what brought down Ted Heath, the the, the uh, yachtsman paedophile in chief. Do you remember him? They brought him down. But this is this is this is kind of designed to bring Harry Perkins down. What they're demanding un completely unrealistic pay deals, and Perkins holds out against them. And then he's criticised from his left-wing buddies. Oh, no, you've got to pay him whatever they want, because, of course, the left think there's an infinite supply of other people's money, don't they? So, basically, Marcus Morgan, the head of MI5, George Fison, the, the newspaper magnate, the Rupert Murdoch-like character, and this, these got people within the, the government and the civil service all conspire to bring Harry Perkins' government down through economic and financial sabotage, through engineered strikes, and people just get fed up because they don't have electricity, it's getting near Christmas, the weather's very cold. And the king is, you see, it's, a, it's sort of set in the near future. So it's like set in the, uh, in the late 80s rather than the early 80s, but of course no one knew the queen would go on as long as we did. So the king is called King Charles III, who of course is the upcoming monarch name of Prince Charles. <laughs> so... Um, they, they they do everything they can and Perkins holds out against them. Um, and in the end though they get him they they what happens is there is a, a accident. I mean there's no doesn't seem to be any I don't know if there's any hints in the book. I mean I didn't detect any, I was looking out for them. That this accident was somehow a false flag operation. But what happens is it's a it's a um a nuclear power station near Lake Windermere in Cumbria has a an accident now that is based partly on reality because there was it's similar to the accident that actually did happen at Windscale nuclear power station which is not far from there actually today it's called Sellafield in Cumbria in I think it was the early 1960s this happened and it's, it's basically this happens again and Perkins and it's of course it's a terrible disaster this nuclear power station has a meltdown it was not quite as bad as Fukushima or Chernobyl but basically the whole thing is is shit canned and there's a, there is a, like a minor radioactive leak which blows blows all the wind across the country. And Fison starts posting in his newspapers that millions of people are going to die. Um, and that does bring him down. 
Now there's a couple, he has a couple of minor characters that are interesting. There's this girl called Elizabeth, who is like the niece of one of the people trying to bring Lady Elizabeth Fine, that Fane, that's it. And she's the daughter of the fourth Earl, former equity to the king, who is part of this conspiracy to de to kick out Perkins. And she's like um she's very she's sort of very left wing aristocrat who's sort of like she's sort of slumming out with this boyfriend of hers who's very working class and um and he's an obnoxious little prick. He's always I don't know why she's with him actually, because he's always putting her down. He's always he's a lot of inverted snobbery there. He's always going on and on about his background and her background, and because he's a working class guy, how superior he is to her with her privileged silver spoon in mouth sort of attitude background. And she doesn't seem to mind. She sort of takes this guilt trip on the chin. That sort of thing's always annoyed me, that kind of inverted snobbery. Because people who do it don't consider themselves to be real snobs. And it's it's very, very nasty, actually. Um, it's funny, people always think about snobs, and people think the snob is the lord and lady of the manor or something. It's not. Those people are actually very... What I find is the old aristocracy is quite respectful to the working class. They're always very nice. Most of them are quite nice to their servants. They give them presents at Christmas and things like that. The, the, the people who really hate the the white working class in this country you you don't find them in stately homes you find them in university de university faculties gender studies departments uh uh hardline remain voting clubs and things like that the people who just say you know we don't want a second referendum we want to cancel article 50 because a bunch of white van drivers t chose to take us out of the country the poly bees of this world you know the Asher cars, people like that. There, that's where you get the real snobbery, the real anti-white working class hatred. What's that? That's oh, nothing. It's all right. But anyway, that that sort of she now she she like she makes him away. She she actually warns Perkins because she ends up working for Perkins. She gets a job, and he he and he ends up. So I think he ends up working for Perkins, and then she like passes messages on to him through. Who she passed a message on to him, who passes them on to Perkins. And I can't remember the name of the man. He's oh, uh, what's his name? No, Reg Reg Smith, I think. Now Reg Smith is the name of the nuclear power person. Now I've got to say, there's going to be spoilers in this. The not the nuclear power person, the power plant guy, the the union leader who's working for MI5. And it's Elizabeth's boyfriend is this chap who who is, is um. I can't remember his name. It'll be here somewhere. But anyway, he's all right. It's um, it's not on the character list, but um, he's the one. He's a, he's a bit like I say. He's a bit of an obnoxious inverted snob. He's working. He's working for Perkins, and he's got this girlfriend, and she's very fond of him. They're obviously. I think they quite have a happy relationship. But she's. He's always going on about how superior he is to her because he's working class. Um. But what happened now? There's a distinct difference between the TV series and the book. If you've watched the TV series, and I think this is maybe why I sort of I envisioned Perkins as looking different to how he did in the TV series. I mean, he's very well portrayed by Ray McNally. He was an Irishman. He portrays this sort of like salt of the earth North Country, a working class white guy from England very well. But. Um, in in the book in the in the TV series he he maintains a hard line stance all the way through. Yet in the book, the stress of it really wears him down. He st he does have like a bit of a breakdown and he becomes kind of really he be he he's, he becomes traumatized by it all and his health suffers basically because of all the because of all the aggravation that happens um, and the, all the people that are against him. And in the end, what what Ends what all ends for him again. This is a spoiler, so switch off for the next five minutes if you if you don't want to know what happens. Mo this girl called Molly, this woman called Molly, who's actually in, she's married to a guy who's who is um, the head of this company that is basically has been blamed for the nuclear accident. She uh, is married to this guy, but she was also having an affair with Perkins, and this is like about twenty years before the time of the book is set. Um, he, he's like she's get she she married him after she finished with Perkins, but she was seeing Perkins on the side. Um, 
But anyway, Perkins didn't know this when he was negotiating with her husband about getting him the contract to run the nuclear power station. And so basically the, the conspirators think they've got him. They, they, it was a scandal that would destroy him, so they just they just they leveled this at him and said, Look, we know you were sh you, you were shagging this girl who was who was with this man who married him two days after she ended your the affair. You and she, he were negotiating about this particular deal. This is before he was Prime Minister when he was like Home Secretary or something. And they say to him, Look, you can either resign or we're gonna take this to George Fison and he's gonna publish it in his newspapers. And the, and the coup is like, um, yeah, PM in reactor love triangle, Perkins in Windermere scandal, Tories demand inquiry. And so Perkins resigns. He agrees to resign. And um, the last the last scene of the book is, Harry Perkins was not seen in public again for nearly a, the year. Uh, most of that time he remained in, um, he remained in seclusion at Chequers. Security was very shy, tight. And it gives a list of all the people, who, what happens afterwards. Basically, it's not a happy ending. Um, the conspirators have a big celebration when they bring him down. They said, um, uh, the Atlantic Alliance, the Common Market, the House of Lords. It's interesting, you see, that in those days, you see, the left, in the early 80s, the left was very anti-EU. They didn't call it the EU, it was just the Common Market. But they were very anti-it in those days. Uh, now, of course, they're, they're pro-it. It's really strange. A victory for sanity. When Faison rejoined his guests, Alford was telling a story. This is the guy at the BBC, who's head of the BBC, which is one of the conspirators. A fellow, an anchorman at the BBC Radio 4 breakfast programme, had done a little jig in the corridor outside the studio when he heard Perkins had resigned. Been nothing like it since the night Allende was overthrown in Chile. Because, of course, Allende, Salvador Allende, was the president of Chile in South America, who was overthrown in a coup organised by the CIA. And they put in this guy called General Pinochet. It was a military coup. With the help of Henry Kissinger, he very famously said, "This is far too important for the people to decide." This is a famous quote about the AND coup, which doesn't that sound exactly like um, Jill Swinson, Jeremy Corbyn? Uh, you know, this is too important for the people to decide. Not legally binding. It was just a referendum. Let's forget it. Let's revoke Article 50. Um, but anyway, yeah, Pinochet came in. He locked all his opponents in a in a football stadium and they just basically froze to death. He was a, he was a brutal man, Pinochet. Um, and so Sir George proposed a po toast to Craddock. The British public, he said, would never know how much reason they had to be grateful to Sir Peregrine, that's the head of MI5. Craddock smiled modestly and raised his glass of orange juice. Everyone should feel proud, he said. There had been no tanks on the streets, no one had gone to the firing squad apart from the odd demonstrator. On the receiving end of a police baton, no one had even been injured. In fact, he said with a wan smile, it was a very British coup. Now, in the TV series, it's different. Now, in the TV series, like I said, it's slightly more upbeat. The ending is more upbeat. Um, it's a bit more sinister as well, because um, Perkins, as I said, is not, he does, he's not worn down by all the aggravation. And in the end, he's about to make a confession on TV. Or, well, uh, now, he's about to announce his resignation on TV. Then he um, he suddenly starts telling them, telling everyone about the conspiracy against him and, and informing the public. And the guy in the BBC gallery is about to cut it off, but he's a friend of Perkins and he doesn't. So, and then the last scene, you hear like you hear helicopters and military radio chatter. You know, there's actually been a military crew coup in Britain. Now, could that actually happen? As I said, it's not. It's a very different situation now. We have essentially an arch-conservative anti-EU government. But this is, so the times have changed. Britain is a complete member state of the EU. But um, we now have a, a left wing, which is very pro-EU. It's they're federalist. They're very, very, as we say in Wales and Scotland, very pro-EU. And they are now conspiring this EU against the Prime Minister. They, so it's, it's, the, the polls have shifted. In the book, it is the, the conservative right and the um, the economic, the moneyed classes in Britain conspiring with NATO and the US establishment to bring down a left-wing Prime Minister. Today we have um, the the United States of Europe, that political poll, conspiring with the left in Britain to bring down a right-wing Prime Minister. Because what's happening, what happens in the book is very similar to what's happened with Boris Johnson. 
he is the Harry Perkins of this book, of the, of the real world. I mean, obviously Mullen doesn't see it that way because he's left-wing himself. The novel that foretold the rise of Corbyn could easily be called the novel that foretold the rise of Boris Johnson. And I'm just wondering how... F it makes me wonder how far will the elite go to prevent Brexit? I mean, I'm, not, I'm, I'm actually in doubt whether they can actually prevent Brexit now. But whether they, what they'll do is, after Brexit Day on, on Halloween, they will, um, they will try and engineer a situation where we basically get a punishment beating, and we want, we'll, we'll be begging to go back in. And if they try to actually stop it happening on the 31st, it's just going to be too obvious. I think they're going to be a lot more careful. But these traitors in government, these conspirators, what they're going to do? is they are going to make life as, ha as hellish as possible for Boris Johnson. They're going to try and prevent him repealing the Lisbon Treaty. They're going to try and repent, re prevent him repealing the uh, Defence Unification Act. And you, you probably said, what's that? Defence Unification Act? What's he talking about? Well, just watch my interviews with Caroline Stevens. Watch her interviews with David Ellis. Basically, even completely aside from the Brexit issue, there's an attempt to unify... The all EU member states armed forces under a single command structure, and that includes Britain, even in a post-Brexit Britain. That has to be repealed, they, and you can bet these agents in the EU, the agents in the EU, are going to try and prevent him doing that. They're also going to conspire with the European Central Bank to try and um, basically raise raise the interest rates and do other things on the various loans that Britain's had, because of course all EU member states are in debt up to their eyeballs in, by the European Central Bank. One of the first things that happened after the Lisbon Treaty was passed in Ireland is their their man on the ground, P Donald, what's his name, Peter Sutherland. He um, he engineered a massive loan to Ireland over two billion pounds to Ireland by the European Central Bank. It's it's horrific, and of course that's gonna what that that, that means essentially is it's an anchor, it's a hook that keeps you in. And that's what they're going to try and do. So it's not over when it comes to Brexit. I'll do an entire live stream about this at some point, closer to the time. But it's not over by a long stretch. I'll be I'll be happy on Brexit Day. Of course I will be. I'll be very happy. But I'll, I'll understand it's just it's a step in the right direction. But it's not the only thing. Now, this this is very it's too, it's actually almost too close to reality. And again, I think the Corbyn metaphor is wrong as I was saying, I'll just check it, I'm, I'm still in frame yeah, the Corbyn metaphor is wrong it applies more to Boris but it is a it's a worrying situation because it's too close to truth and it's as close to the truth now as it was back then, only it's a different scenario as, for, as I've just explained now there's a famous book called Spy Catcher, which is by Peter Wright and um, I actually got a copy of this I remember. Oh, everyone did. Everyone wanted a copy of this. The reason they wanted a copy of it was because the government tried to ban it. Now, this is an ele this is a um, an element of the Streisand effect. If you remember, Barbara Streisand had a her house. Now, there's some aerial photographs of her house, which is, which is near the tops of some cliffs, and um, she tried to get the the she tried to withdraw the publication of these photos, saying it was her privacy because that was her house. As a result, the the photos went went viral, and everyone wanted to have a copy of them. So, the, what what the Streisand effect means is, the more you try to stop something being spread, it can have a backlash with with a reverse effect. That is, it becomes more popular, more people want to see it. And it says here on Wikipedia, the allegations prove scandalous on publication, but more so because the British government attempted to ban Spycatcher, ensuring its profit and notoriety. They should have kept their mouths shut because if they'd done that, it would just be some obscure biography and no one would really take any notice about it. No, no one would really take any notice about it. But this was in the pre-internet days. I mean, today it would have been um, today it would have been a um, it would like have been PDF. But in those days, it was like it went on for publication in Australia, and there were people trying to smuggle it into the country, and you could like get it on the black market, you know. <laughs> I got. I had a friend of my dad's actually who went and got a copy. It cost him. It cost him a bloody fortune. He managed to get a copy of Spycatcher smuggled in. Mm. 
But it's, it's this, the reason they wanted to ban this book, when, when you read it, you find out why. I mean, most of it is not that interesting. It's about a guy who's a scientist who worked as in, he worked for MI5 in the Cold War. And um, it was, it's interesting in some ways, because, for example, you think, well, he'd spend most of his time spying on the Russians, because it's the Cold War. But in fact, he spends most of his time spying on the French, because France was a bit of a loose cannon in the Cold War. It was um, had a very strong Communist Party. It had a very on-off relationship with NATO. It joined originally, then left in, I think, 1958 it left. And since then it would refuse to rejoin NATO. Um, France has its own independent nuclear deterrent. There's all kinds of reasons why everyone would want to have a look at France, because France was sort of sitting very on the fence in the Cold War. That's, um, what's interesting is he, he makes a lot of rather strange... Um, he makes the claim, first of all, that Sir Roger Hollis was the sixth man. Now, by the sixth man, I'm referring to... I'm referring to the Cambridge Spy Ring, and I've talked about that before. I've been reading up on the Cambridge Spy Ring for, because, I, um, because I'm because i so interested in espionage, because the book I'm re writing at the moment, my new book, which I've told you all, it has an espionage theme. And so Roger Hollis was head of MI5 for many years, and um, it says here, after Kim Philby's flight from Beirut to Moscow, because Kim Philby defected in, in early 60s because he was going to be arrested as a spy, rumours began to circulate that Hollis had alerted him to his impending arrest. Well, actually, it was Anthony Blunt that alerted him because he visited him just before that. But it's certainly possible that um, Hollis let Anthony Blunt know. Because um, it's all very... He was tangled up in the Profumo scandal as well. Um, during the 50s and 60s, a large number of IMF 5 operations suggested the Soviets had been tipped off. It's interesting because he was at Cambridge with... Yep, he went to the... He went. He went to Cambridge, I think. No, let's have a look. I oh, know he was in the. He was in. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. No, he was at Worcester College, Oxford. All oh, right, but he was a member of the Hypocrites Club. He moved in those kinds of circles, so he knew. He was knew, knew the students at Cambridge, the Cambridge Five. He, he's entirely separate from the Cambridge Spy Ring, but he's been accused of being an agent. Very interesting, that. Yeah. So that's one. That's one. That's one reason why Spy Catch, I think cause some trouble but the main reason was there's a scene in it where where is it um, oh where is it let's have a look one second there's a where was it it's gone now oh, yeah, Harold Wilson conspiracy theories here we go since the mid-1970s, a wide variety of theories have emerged regarding British Labour Prime Minister Harold Wilson. Now, this all comes up in the... This comes up in the book. These range from Wilson being a Soviet agent. It's interesting that when Wilson was at Oxford, he was... A, he was I think he was a member of one of these clubs, and he did a talk, and many people have talked about the speech he made. David Icke mentions this in his book, about the secret plan for the New World Order. Oh, yeah, um. Here we go, yeah. In his memoir, Spycatcher, former MI5 officer Peter Wright stated that the head of CIA's counterintelligence division, James Angleton, told him that Wilson was a Soviet agent. Right, yeah, that's interesting. Now, there's one scene in the book. I've got, where is it? Uh, I've, got, I've got a PDF of it somewhere, actually. Let's just check my documents. Oh, no, it's not. No, it's not. Okay. I'm got it. I'll just see if I can find it. Hang on. Here we go. There's a scene in the book. Spycatcher Harold Wilson. Bloody, bloody, blah. The Wilson plot, MI5. Spy. Oh, I'll, I'll try a different. Uh, Spycatcher plot to. Bring down government. Because what what happened was, I mean, I've given it away now a bit here now. Um, here we go. All right, the Guardian. Oh, it's the Guardian. Oh, blimey! Here we are. I'm not going to read it in my Guardian voice. Um, yeah, Harold Wilson resigned as Prime Minister. Blimey, blimey, blimey. There was a. 
His, his resignation has never been fully explained. Uh, Peter Wright confirmed in his book, Spycatcher, Wilson was a victim of protected illegal campaign of destabilisation. Well, this is exactly this, really, the... This is kind of the um, scenario in the book. Um, MI5 men's burgled the homes of the Prime Minister's aides. Well, that happens in the book. In fact, they, they burgled the Prime Minister's own flat, where he used to live before he moved to number 10. They tried to pin all kinds of nonsense on him, that his devoted political secretary, Marsha Williams, posed a threat to national security because she was married to an IRA sympathiser. It's interesting, right, because in the book, it's so... I think it's slightly different. Of course, in the book or the TV series, I think in the book, one of the guys... He has an affair with this young woman, a constituency Labour Party person. Yet in the TV series, that same character has an affair with a woman who's in the IRA and has to resign. Either way, they both have to resign. And he, and the, I think it's the Home Secretary. He's like the, he's he's the Wil, he's Wilson's closest aide. So wait, I'm not going to read the Guardian. I'll, you don't get any, you don't get any, anything really good from the the Guardian. Oh, there's something on MI5's own page. Could you believe this? Can you believe this? Security Service MI5, the Wilson plot. One of the most persistent controversies involving the Security Service is the so-called Wilson plot, where officers of our service were accused of having conspired against the Labour Prime Minister, Sir Harold Wilson. I oh, see this is a debunking article by MI5 itself. <laughs> and of course, we believe every word of that, don't we? We know how incredibly, incredibly impartial MI5 must be when it comes to plotting against... It comes to, to conspiracy theories about itself. Oh, there we go, right. Um, a plot to bring down the government, yeah. Well, okay, basically this scene is um, Spycatcher. Um, secret... Conspiracy. I'll just put that in. Um, okay, the scene in the book. I don't have it here now with me, but read it and you'll see. Is is there's this kind of meeting with all these dark-suited people. It's like yeah, it's just like in this book, which they they're talking about how Harold Wilson must be destroyed. Basically, they're going to carry out a covert coup d'état against Harold Wilson. And I probably I might well do an entire article about this or something because it sounds really really interesting, and um, that's in the book. And maybe that's one of the reasons, or the principal reason perhaps, that Spycatcher was destined to be banned. I don't know, but it leads me to think that possibly this book, rather than rather than the subtitle being the novel that foretold the rise of Corbyn, the subtitle, as I said, could be. The novel that foretold the rise of Boris Johnson, or maybe the novel that told in fictional form what really happened to Harold Wilson. I wonder. Hmm. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this little quick video. Um, I'll do another one probably because I've got loads of time this week. Well, I've got to do the Panmo show tomorrow. Well, I'll do another one. I've got some other ideas for videos. Um, and. Um, yeah, I will do. I'll be doing more on the Brexit situation because, of course, it's just three weeks just over until the time it's supposed to happen. Yeah, um, and I, I do, obviously, hope we will have Brexit that day on Halloween. I will be doing some videos and, and also a Panama radio show about that. I will be in London in one capacity, either to celebrate or to protest, probably on Halloween. And. Um, you will hear about it on Hapanmo TV, I promise you that, because it's all connected with this. It's all connected. And please do check out my interviews with Caroline Stevens on Caroline Stevens Seeking the Truth. Um, I'll actually ask her if she wants to do another one, because there's an awful, awful lot we need to talk about with everything that's going on. So thank you all of you for watching Hapanmo TV. Hospital Port is pride and dignity. Stop the New World Order. <laughs>